greatest sweet sour so good to taste This is Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss. Thank you for turning in to 60 Minutes of Delicious Radio at High V. <laughs> and as we do and have done for many months every week, we are going to start off the show with Emily Rose Shaw, our health coach. So Emily is going to stick around for the rest of the show, which is, I think that might be a first. I mean, I don't know. Sometimes I feel, I'm not sure whether to feel rejected or what, because <laughs> you're always leaving me, you know, in, in after the first 10 minutes. But ten, this show, you're actually sticking around, and it's because we have Liana Werner Gray on, and Liana is the author of The Earth Diet, and you, Emily, are actually involved with Liana in terms of developing some recipes, so we're going to get into that a little bit later on. But I'm really glad you're going to stick around for the rest of the hour. Oh, I am too. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite worth it, especially tonight. All right. <laughs> so, so Liana, uh, hi. Welcome to Great Taste. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Emily. So, I guess I wasn't familiar with the Earth Diet, so maybe we should just start at the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, after that, we can talk about how the Earth Diet developed. Okay, so I was born and raised in Australia, and I grew up in mostly in the center of Australia in the outback bush called Alice Springs, and I went to school with half white people and half indigenous people. So I learned at a young age, and we were taken out on school excursions, how the aboriginals lived off the land and purely off the land with no technology or machinery, and how they survived and thrived in great health. So I learned from a young age how we could really live um, from what the earth provides us with naturally. And so I carried that with me throughout my schooling years, and um, I became addicted to junk food when I moved out of home. So I was 17 years old, and my mum wasn't around to cook me, you know, healthy meals and make sure I wasn't eating junk food. So I started eating junk foods, and five years later, I became very, very ill, and that's what was my awakening and it's what changed my life to be where I am today. Wow. So you became very, very ill. And so obviously there was some point when you became ill that you said, I've got to take control of my life. And at that point, did you connect the fact that you were ill with your food intake or was that something that came out a little bit later? Yeah, I knew right away that it was my food intake because I would, would actually binge eat on junk food. I wouldn't just have like a hamburger and stop at that. I would have a hamburger and then I would have ice cream and then I would have chips and I would just eat until I was really, really sick. And I recognized that this was not normal behavior or what I considered normal. And I, I knew that it was unhealthy and throughout you know, the, the last few years that I was binge eating, I said to myself, okay, this will be the very last day that I eat junk food like this. I don't ever want to keep eating like this. I, you know, I said, I'll start again tomorrow. I'll start again next week. And starting from tomorrow, I'll have a new life. But then came tomorrow and I would crave junk food again, so I would eat it. So I was in this vicious um, circle, cycle and I did, I realized that it was the food that was causing me to be bloated, to have digestive um, issues and just to feel like really stripped of energy and I, f I figured that you know if I could eat healthy food I would be feeling a lot better but I just was not craving healthy food. So how did you decide then what was healthy for you to eat? Did you have, did you do research in books? Did you go to uh, Weight Watchers? I mean what, what was <laughs> it that... that, that <laughs> Well, I I wanted to keep living a life where I could eat my favorite taste. Like, I thought, surely there's a way I could have chocolate, but it be healthy. So one day I had this realization, like, why am I eating foods with absolutely no nutritional value? And I thought, okay, well, I'm eating it because I enjoy it. But then I thought, well, how much am I enjoying this junk food? Well, not 
much because I would get the five minutes of like fulfillment satisfaction after eating, you know, hamburger or chocolate or chips, candy. And then after that, I would have to deal with digesting it. And that's where the issues were. So I thought I'm not really getting that much pleasure from what I'm eating. So I thought, you know, surely there's a way I can still continue to eat my favorite tastes and flavors, but it also provide me with nutrition. So I had that um, pondering thought. And then that's what led me to create a lot of recipes for myself and then of course yeah I did a lot of research every single day I that became my job so I did research on the internet I read books and I came across books like uh, natural cures books so books on people that were healing themselves of cancer and depression and all these kind of issues with natural foods and eliminating junk foods and chemicals and so you saw all this research and Obviously, you had to think to yourself, well, a lot of this is, is, is obviously, um, you know, the experience of, of individuals, that, that the collected experiences of different individuals. And at that point, did you have some type of awakening inside yourself that, that it was tangible, some type of eureka experience? Or did you just say, I'm going to have to try this and, and see what happens? I mean, what was it like for you experientially, emotionally? Yeah, I just really said, you know, I'm going to have to try this. I'm going to have to eliminate this junk food. And my turning point was when one day a tumor popped in my neck. And it popped the size of a golf ball. And I thought it was just a swollen gland. So I ignored it for a few weeks. And I became more and more sick and more and more tired. And I thought, wow, if I'm really going to heal this, I have to completely transform my health and everything I'm putting into my body. Emotionally, I was stressed because I knew that that would be hard for me just to end a five-year addiction to junk food and just start eating healthy food. I knew that that would be challenging, but obviously I had to do it at that point because my health was on the, on the line. I just, I, I guess I'm trying to think, you know, a self-referral here, you know, what would I do if I was in a situation like that? And it, it seems like you were very, you know, you had a lot of initiative to go out and try to discover this stuff yourself. And, you know, when I think about it, I think, oh, you know what, I'm, I'd just probably rely on all kinds of, I'd go to doctors probably, or, you know, and I, and I wonder, did you just not have any faith in, in the medical profession? At, or did you, you know, just intuitively feel that you had to go a different way? I intuitively felt like I had to go to the path of nature because that was my roots, that was my upbringing. It's not that I doubt medical doctors, but I did start stop taking any pharmaceutical drugs like aspirins, uh, you know, like Panadol, hmm, what would you call that in America? You know, if we, we have a headache, those kind of things. I stopped taking those when I was younger. Um, but I, yeah, I just, I did go see a few doctors and they confirmed my belief of why I wouldn't heal through them because one doctor told me I got it because I was allergic to cats. And another doctor asked if I would like a cervical cancer shot because at the time they were promoting that. And I just didn't feel like they were approaching the nutritional healing. Uh, and then, so I went into the hospital, I got a biopsy, they took a piece of it out, they tested it. It was a precancerous tumor, so basically they described it was just a, a clump of cells that had formed in my body and in my lymphatic system actually and would cause me some issues if I had not taken it out or done radiation. And I knew that radiating my body was not an option. I just, I really knew that this was my opportunity to restore my body back to health and put a lot of nourishment and nutrition back into my body because I had deprived my body of nutrition for so many years. Right. Now, so then over how much time did you actually, did it take you to break, we'll say, your junk food addiction and, uh, well, let's start there. How much time did it take you to uh, break your junk food addiction? And uh, during that time, did you have any, you know, did you fall off the wagon at all? Or did you st have you stuck, did you stick with it? <laughs> well, okay, so let's say I had the addiction for five years. And it's taken me a few years to unwind that. So I, when I found out my biopsy results, I went and healed. And in three months, the tumor was completely gone. And I did this with giving up my junk food, and I started juicing and having a lot of soups and a lot more plant-based raw foods. I still craved junk foods once a week, and I would go out and buy candy and chocolate, less than I had done in the past, but I, would, I still had those cravings. And I would say once a week during that three months, I gave in and I ate junk foods, 
but then I felt really, really guilty about that. But I was still able to heal myself in those three months because I believe I was putting so much nutrition in my body and also because I did believe that I could self-heal. I did believe that I would be better from it. And then, so this was April when, when the tumor was gone. And when it came to October that same year, I was afraid because I was still craving that junk food really strongly and still really wanting to do it. I was afraid I would slip back into my old habits. And this is the day that I created the Earth Diet. I thought, I do not, I want to be held accountable. I never want to go back on this binge eating of junk food again. I'm going to commit to one in whole year of eating what Earth provides naturally. And I started a blog to keep me accountable. And that's when I broke the addiction throughout those 365 days of eating only Earth's most natural foods. Now, can you define that for us a little bit more um, clearly, what the Earth diet really means? The Earth diet really means basically the Earth's diet. So whatever Earth is providing us with naturally, so plants and seeds and nuts, fruits, vegetables, and Right, right now the Earth Diet is a website where people can go and access recipes. There are hundreds of recipes and there's recipes for every type of eater. There's recipes for the meat eater. There's recipes for the chocolate lover. There's also recipes for people wanting to heal. There's recipes for people wanting to strengthen their kidneys or their liver. And so right now the, the Earth Diet exists as a recipe, a, a place for people to access recipes. But let's talk about distinctions, though. When you say it's it's a diet that allows us to eat what the earth provides, is that literally what it means? In other words, there's, you know, if can things be transformed, or is it just, you know, you take it as it is from the plant? Can you make bread out of grain, for example? Yes. So there are so many different levels to the earth diet, and perhaps the, the most pure way to live and to eat might be to live on your own farm and space and grow all of your own plants and then eat purely from that and never having to venture outside of your area or community or never having to you know, buy something online that comes from Brazil, for example. So just getting really back to where you're from and growing from your own community might be the the most pure way to do it. But for people like me who live in New York City who still want to eat Earth's most natural foods, there are things, options like making your own smoothies or, you know, making your own chocolate desserts, even freezing a bunch of juices and smoothies so that they can be taken out each day of the week. So it's just about upgrading to the next possible best level of, of health and using Earth's most natural ingredients. So obviously, you know, if I plant a cilantro plant in my in my apartment and grow that and I take a leaf of that each day and eat that, I'm getting a lot of nutrition just from that cilantro plant and it's natural to my environment and I'm growing it. Or, you know, I can go out to I can go out and find my own grains and I can process that into a whole wheat flour and I can make pancakes from that. So it really depends on the individual and what the individual wants to eat. So for my own self I want to eat things like pancakes and smoothies, juices and yeah, raw cheesecakes and I'm I'm a dessert lover, so that's a big part of my life. So I do make uh, a lot of my own desserts using natural organic ingredients. <laughs> well, <laughs> for, the, for those of us who who have a sweet tooth, which I don't, by the way, um, you know that's that's good to know because I'm sure that for a lot of people, when they hear the word diet, they immediately think, "Oh boy, you know I can't have desserts." And what I'm kind of getting from you, Liana, is really there are no limits to this. It's just whatever you're going to do. It's just you want to do it using the most pure and fantastic ingredients. Uh, especially if they're local ingredients, that's even better, and um, fresh is best. Yes, exactly. Well said. I'm wondering also how much of a role, because I, I'm getting this from listening to you and looking at some of the things on, on your website, uh, how much of a role do you believe attitude is in relation to the actual food itself? I think it's a huge part, and I believe it goes hand in hand. I believe that it's easier to have a better attitude and better thoughts when we eat better foods, 
coming from a better environment. And I know there are a lot of studies that show that depression and negative thinking comes from eating foods that are highly processed or have a lot of chemicals or that are made from genetically modified organisms. So all of that definitely does play a part. Now, I'm, I'm curious as to, okay, so your own personal journey, you've, you've uh, had this addiction, you got onto this, this idea of the earth diet based on your background, you took yourself uh, to task and said, okay, I'm going to, you know, eat this for a year, and you journaled, and you, you, you were very disciplined, and then where did it go from there? Well, uh, people started to read the blog, and it became quite popular to a lot of young women who I discovered were doing the same exact thing as me, uh, which is funny because when I was going through it, I thought I was the only person on the planet who could do such a bad thing to my body and um yeah so the blog and me opening up and saying that in the blog that you know i was sick and tired of suffering and eating junk foods it got it got me a lot of readers and so it opened up a whole new world for me and now it's you know it's my main job and i love it um i've helped thousands of people since then with all kinds of health issues from cancer to diabetes to depression, um, bulimia, and yeah, I just help people basically find recipes that they need, and I love coming up with new recipes. I love working with people like Emily, who's also coming up with excellent recipes that are helping a lot of people. It's very fulfilling. One thing that caught my attention that you said you had the experience of finding that there were a lot of women who related to uh, your story because it was also part of their story, and something interesting is do you have do you find the preponderance of people that you um that are relating to the earth diet or to what you have to say are women or or, or not i would say majority just over majority are women but there are also a lot of men i'm finding that the the people that are most interested in the earth diet are around my age you know um in the 20s and 30s and they're people that want to live like a productive life and also go after their dreams and their passions, but also, you know, enjoy their favorite tastes like desserts and chocolate. And I believe we live in an era where we can have our cake and eat it too. And so it's those kind of people that are really enjoying the earth diet. But then there are, of course, people that are, you know, dying of cancer that are using the recipes as well. There are, there are young school children who are 14 or 15 that are using the earth diet recipes to gain more confidence at school, to feel better and, you know, heal their acne. And then there are a lot of families that are using it and um, helping their children basically just not have to go down a path of junk food at all. Now, is there a specific starting point for people who recognize some of the things that you're saying and they want to change different aspects of their uh, eating uh, life. Uh, is there one particular way that the Earth Diet starts off, or is it all individualized? It's really individualized and up to the person with what they want to do. For me, I want, like, I did not want to live another day not committing to, to doing it for a year full on. I wanted to change everything, and not just what I ate, but also what I put on my skin, my shampoos and moisturizers. You know, I made all of those Earth Diet friendly as well. But some people come and they, they're quite happy with their health. They just want a few pointers and to add a few more bits of nutrition to their life. So I say to people when they're first starting, start with a lemon water each day because that's probably the most inexpensive, quick way to put nutrition into our body. And just we just squeeze a lemon into some water and that alkalizes our body. It's high in vitamin C. It's very refreshing. And when we do that in the morning, we tend to have a healthier day ahead of us. And then if people want to take it to the next level, I say, okay, introduce one juice into your life every single day now for the rest of your life, whether it's a green juice, a beet juice, apple juice, orange juice, grapefruit juice, whatever, just get that juice, get that nutrition at an instant cellular level. And then for the people who really want to take it as far as, you know, completely transforming their life, then they... Um, they'll do like a program. We offer downloadable programs to say someone will download like a 21-day nourishment program and they'll go out and use a shopping list and buy all of the ingredients that they need for those three weeks and they'll just live completely from the earth for those three weeks. And it's 
extremely powerful. I just want to mention too, I just think it's amazing how many different um, products and services that the Earth Diet offers. And I recently started with the Earth Diet being a mentor. Uh, there's a few of us and it's just really amazing. Talk about individualizing the Earth Diet de depending on what exactly they're looking for. But I just think that it's so beautiful how the Earth Diet really um, has something for everyone and it really is a philosophy about w an abundance of what the earth provides naturally focusing on healthy recipes rather than lack rather than restriction um, so I just think it's really wonderful that people can start they have the opportunity to start at their own pace and in a variety of different ways and that there is someone something there for everyone Liana Warner Gray is our guest on Great Taste. I'm Steve Boss, and you're listening to 60 Minutes of Delicious Radio on Solar Powered Crew FM. Liana, I guess people can find out more information at theearthdiet.org. Is that right? Yes, exactly. And I wonder if before we, we leave you uh, to get with Emily and start working on a couple of recipes from, from the Earth Diet, uh, you, you offered a couple of practical tips. One was to start the day with some fresh squeezed lemon juice and water. That's, that sounds great. Then to integrate some type of fresh juice into your uh, daily routine. And anything else, uh, maybe one other tip that you could give us? Sure. I would say... Um a really, really easy one is just orange juice, and that's as simple as getting one to four oranges and just hand-squeezing them into a cup and drinking that because that's uh, immune-boosting, alkalizes the body, and it's extremely high in vitamin C, and it's a way for all of us to juice every single day, and um, I really feel like if every human was to commit to having a juice every single day for the rest of our life, we could really transform our health and the health of the planet so that's a good one, especially for people that have to go to work. Uh, they can just grab an orange on the way out, put it in the bag, and then juice it at work when it's lunchtime. I think that's really, I, I love that idea. Fresh juice is so delicious. But also my smoothies are really good, too. Can, can that be part of the Earth Diet? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> smoothies are a huge part of the Earth Diet. It's a good way to get all of our nutrients into one drink. And our body can handle digesting liquids quite well. So it provides us with a lot of energy. Liana, thanks very much. What an inspiring story, and we're looking forward to working with Emily the rest of the hour to see how we can integrate some more of the principles that you're espousing at theearthdiet.org. Thank you so much, Liana. Thanks for having me, guys. You are so welcome. Wow. I love the fact that she is so positive. That's, that's, that's what really strikes me. I, I love the fact that the whole basis to her program is, hey, you can enjoy everything that you want. You don't have to sacrifice anything. And that's how we're going to approach it. So that to me is, is an approach that I think is, is lacking with most people because most people it's like, okay, well, you got yourself into this fix. So now you're going to have to get yourself out of it and it's not going to be pretty. Yeah, I, I really agree. Um, like Liana said, there is something there for everyone at the Earth Diet. It's been uh, so wonderful working with a lot of people um, with a variety of wants and needs and being able to actually um, fulfill that based on, um, based on food, based on natural, healthy foods. And the other thing about it is that it, it, I, I like the fact that it's all inclusive because usually it's, oh, well, you have to. You know, you can, no, no, you can't eat meat anymore. Or no, you you have to do it this way, or you have to do it that way. But it's it's really something that is a program that anybody can kind of tailor to their own individual needs in that sense. And and especially those of us who have those of us who may have certain types of addictions that can essentially continue with those addictions, but just in a taking a different angle. Yeah, I mean, throughout all my studies in nutrition and prevention. You know, it's true that there's a lot of different opinions about what to eat, but uh, there is a mutual agreement among all health experts, basically, that, um, you know, eating whole foods is going to be good for your health, whether it includes a lot of meat, some meat, a little meat, um, whether it's raw, whether it's cooked, you know, all these different preparation methods, you know, that's one thing that we know for sure is that when you eat foods in their purest state, 
they're, they have nutrition, they have nourishment. So it kind of simplifies things a little bit for people. What's fascinating is that there's an article in the New York Times this week where chefs, because so many chefs, the farm-to-table movement is passe. I don't know if people know that. You know, that's that's passe because, oh, yes, farm-to-table is, like, so old. You know, it's, it's those people who are doing that kind of stuff, they don't want to be known as farm-to-table because so many other people are already doing that now. It's it's not, you're not special anymore. And then, of course, those chefs who were doing it before, there was an official movement at farm-to-table. They they right. never wanted to be identified with it because they didn't ever feel the need to put on their menu that they got their lettuce from this local guy or their meat from this local guy because that's how they always did it. And I understand that completely actually but there was a meeting in Westchester County New York this past week with Dan Barber who is the head of Stone Barns Foundation and whose restaurant there uh, Blue Hill at Stone Barns is an amazing place to eat if you ever have the opportunity to go there and, and uh, eat it it's a working farm and all the food comes from the Hudson River Valley right around there but anyway he invited a large group of chefs who are very influential, including people like Ferran Adria uh, from Spain and numerous other chefs from, from uh, Europe and the States, to participate in a conference that had to do with what he believes is the next phase of development of nutrition, not just nutrition, but food that is good for you and also even more interesting, and that is to work with the breeders those farmers who are actually creating the different types of seeds, we're not talking about genetically modified seeds, we're talking about through the process of hybridization or custom selection, things that have been going on for you know a long period of time, 100 years even, uh, hundreds of years, um, but to actually create things that are more colorful, grains that are more colorful, for example, and nutritious. So it's, it's a really fascinating thing because I think what we're talking about is just really the whole thing about the earth diet is eating more healthy foods at the same time trying to enjoy, allowing food to be a c continued source of enjoyment for us and enjoyment along with its nutritional value. And now the chefs who are leading you know, the leading chefs around the world are thinking about how can we start that actually from the beginning when seeds are actually developed and then the plants are actually grown with the intent to provide not only more nutrition but more enjoyment from a sensory standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's really important, you know, from every step of the way is really important. So speaking of that, yes. tell us how we're going to enjoy our senses with what you're going to pre prepare. We're going to start out with an unbaked chocolate caramel brownie. The, um, these two recipes I created especially for the Earth Diet, and they're going to be published um, in the month of October. And so when so when this is actually airing, they'll be they'll be probably out. And uh, so we're going to do a um, brownie base and then a, a caramel to go on top. Um, and then second, we're going to be doing a spaghetti squash. Um, pasta with cashew, cauliflower, ricotta. Mm, sounds absolutely delicious. And do we get first chance for these recipes for great taste, or do we have to wait for the Earth Diet? <laughs> May have to wait, <laughs> but it's well, it's well worth it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, tr I'll try and uh, get them to come out earlier in the month of October, these specific recipes. How okay, so that? exactly what are you going to be doing uh, over the month of October with the Earth Diet? Well, um, once so I, I created 31 recipes, so um, each day in October, one of the recipes will be um, coming out uh, to all the subscribers and on Facebook. Um, so I'll be posting them on my Facebook too. And then I'm going to continue to do mentoring for Earth Diet clients. So I design meal plans and provide uh, email support to them. So that's what I do. Okay, that's fantastic. Now, do we want to... Uh you want to tell us a little bit about the process of what you're going to go through here? That would be great as far as the fudge brownies are concerned because I'm sure that's where everybody's ready, ready for that. They're, they're excited. Yeah, so um, first I'm just going to be adding three cups of um, walnuts, dry walnuts to a food processor. And um, these are unsoaked. These You want the uh, these nuts to be really um, nice and dry for the texture. Basically we're creating a 
uh, brownie out of nuts, chocolate, dates, and a little sea salt. I like to use a little bit of cinnamon and then um, I use a vanilla bean. So we're going to be using half a vanilla bean for the brownie and half of it for the caramel sauce. So uh, it creates a nice dough. And so I'm going to do that first. Okay, so walnuts, cacao, cacao powder, sea salt. Now, is there anything important that we need to know about this? Like, for example, the cacao powder is a particular type? Um, the one that I, that I use is raw, so in the, it's, it's processed um, as little as possible. That's basically what it means is that um, as many of the antioxidants, as many of the minerals, it, um, it's not heated above, you know, around 118 degrees, so it maintains um, all the nutrition that it has. And, you know, cacao actually has a lot of nutrition, has a lot of, anti it's one of the highest antioxidant foods um, on earth. So um, it's when you start to put a lot, a lot of the sugar and the, um, you know, the, all the milk products, milk solids, all those things, that's when it turns into uh, not the greatest chocolate. All right, and then trying to use a vanilla bean instead of vanilla extract, for example. So again, trying to keep everything whole, as whole as possible. Yeah, exactly, as whole as possible, as minimally processed as possible. Um, but, you know, we're using a food processor, so we're, <laughs> we're mixing it up a little bit. But um, it really is the best of both worlds, combining um, really natural ingredients uh, using technology like a food processor, um, and then the product is delicious. Okay, so now can I just quickly go over this recipe because nobody's going to write it down fast enough, you know, to do it. Okay, sure. so three cups of walnuts, two thirds cup of cacao powder, a quarter teaspoon of sea salt, the seeds of a half of vanilla bean, or one tablespoon of vanilla extract, a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, and one cup pitted medjool dates. So that's that's what you need. And uh, the caramel, though, the way that sounds really good. There you've got a cup of medjool dates that you want to soak for one to two hours first, mm -hmm. a third of a cup of smooth almond butter, mm -hmm. a half a vanilla bean or one teaspoon of vanilla extract, one tablespoon of coconut oil, and a quarter teaspoon of sea salt. Now, it's important in terms of what type of coconut oil because coconut oil used to be a villain, big villain. Mm -hmm. But it's processed totally differently today than it used in terms of the products that's available on the market. But I imagine you can still get the other kind of product too. So what do, what do we need to look for as far as coconut oil is concerned? Um, well, I like to get the um, organic uh, expeller pressed uh, extra virgin coconut oil. I think you can also get virgin too. I think that'll probably be okay. Yeah. But but you don't want it processed any more than that. Right. Right. And coconut oil, you know, it has medium chain fatty acids. It's actually good for the metabolism. Um, it's good for the brain. Uh, you know, it's um, co coconut products are very good. Even though it's a saturated fat, it's a plant saturated fat. So it's different than the saturated fat that you find in some animal foods. So um, I think I, it's actually, and also if you're cooking with it, um, it has a very high smoke point. So it's a great oil to be cooking with. The reason I'm laughing is how many people, you see what the coconut oil listeners, we're looking at something that's white. It's, it's perfectly white, right? How many people, I would date myself, but how many people remember TV time popcorn? Anybody remember TV time popcorn? Right, thank you, Jerry. I'm so glad that one of us here remembers. TV time popcorn, you know, it was the little package. It had the oil on one side and the popcorn on the other, and you just pour it, you put the oil into the pot. And then you poured the, uh, the popcorn already had salt in it, right? It was like a one-stop shop kind of thing. That coconut oil, I guarantee you, it was yellow. It was definitely not what you really wanted. So, so this is, we've come a long way when we think about how, how foods have advanced. Uh, that's why coconut oil had such a bad reputation, actually. Okay, so this is a minimally processed, actually, in terms of, you know, what you need. And, and as far as equipment is concerned to do this recipe, you do need a food processor. That, that makes it much easier, right? Anything else that person needs? Um, yeah, just a food processor, um, a cutting board, a good knife. I mean, it's really pretty easy. Um, I just, you know, put all the dry ingredients in the food processor first, and then you just pulse the food processor um, a few times. You still want some texture from the walnuts, from the nuts. Um, and then I'm adding in a cup of chopped pitted dates gradually until it starts to stick and that becomes your dough. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the point when it starts to stick. And when you get to that point, then you take it out of the processor and you put it onto a cutting board? 
Yes, yes. You put it, or you put it on into a brownie pan, actually. Mm. You put it right into a, ba a brownie pan. And uh, it's nice to actually chill it um, for, I don't know, a, f a few minutes while you're making like, the caramel sauce, for example, that we're going to make next. That kind of makes it more, um, I don't know, compressed and just kind of... Uh, all the flavors kind of merge mm. and are really good. So you're going to press it out in the brownie pan itself. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to let you go about your business, and we're going to talk to Beverly Merson uh, with Cinnabites because uh, <laughs> I'm still trying to recover. I'm still trying to recover from last week's uh, Cinnabites, and um, I don't know what she has planned. So Bev, what's what's happening in the world of cinema and food? Well, Steve, first I have to ask you, what was so funny about Women on Top? What's I'm not going to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> a, a woman asks a man, right? She should know better. Anyway, tonight I'm talking about Romantics Anonymous. It's a French film, it's a comedy, and it's fun, and it's chocolate filled with love. And, or love filled with chocolate. And basically it's about two very, very, very neurotic people. Well, that would define most of us. Even more neurotic than that, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> one who is um, one who owns a wholesale chocolate business, and his name is Jean Re Rene, and um, he's uh, you see him a lot talking to his psychiatrist. And the other woman is going to um, Emotions Anonymous because they're both so scared of everything, as they say. And the woman who's going to Emotions Anonymous, she is a gifted chocolate maker. But she's so neurotic and scared of everything that she works for this man, um, who, Monsieur Mercier, creating chocolates. But she tells Monsieur Mercier that to let everybody know that his chocolate maker is this hermit who lives in the mountains. Because if anybody gave her the attention, she would she faints but she's so scared of attention and of people and so on and then uh Jean René is has a chocolate wholesale business that is on the verge of bankruptcy because his chocolates are very old fashioned so what happens is that Angelique who is the neurotic um gifted chocolate maker comes looking for a job to Mr to Jean René's business and she's coming as a salesperson. She goes out and she see, goes to all these candy stores and they say, no, 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 we don't want your ch chocolates. They're very old fashioned. So she sees this company's on the verge of bankruptcy and she's got to figure out quickly. She needs a job and so on. So what she decides to do is come up with a very, uh, shishi line of chocolates, but she decides, she tells them she's, th she knows where the hermit lives and she sets up this whole thing with a, with a camera. And she puts on an earphone and she's telling the, the little, there's four um, chocolate makers at, at Jean Rene's um, wholesale business. And she's busy telling them how to do it. And it's so beautiful to watch the scene as they're making chocolates. I mean, the word she uses to describe the chocolate, what she's telling to put in the chocolate, the, the, as you see them pour the chocolate, as you see them put it into the molds. It's very, talking about sensory, it's very sensual just watching all of this chocolate. My arm is getting... So I can't I can't move you it can't any further away. Okay. Stand next to me. <laughs> so anyway, so it's very sensual to watch the chocolate be made and so on and so forth. So the story unfolds where these two finally come together in a very romantic way, and it's all through the chocolate. So I recommend this film for anybody who loves chocolate and who enjoys good comedy and foreign films. Is this a then this is subtitled? Of course, it's subtitled. Yes. Yes. Well, for those of us who don't speak French, right? And, and so, 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 so <laughs> it's called Romantics Anonymous. Will you do me a big favor, and, and our listeners a great favor? Would you just send us send me a list of the different films that you've recommended over the last few weeks? Because I think it's easy to get lost, and they're so wonderful. All of your descriptions are great, and they sound so intriguing that I'm sure that it'd be great if we could just publish a little list every week. We could do it every couple of months. We'll just encapsulate what you've come up with because uh, uh, I know I want to put every one of them on my, my must-watch list. That's a great idea, Steve, and I think everyone should be on everyone's must-watch list. Thank you. I will do that. Let's do it. We will. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> Beverly Merson with Cinnabites. Now, 
I don't know if we need to visit, re revisit with Emily. Oh, yeah, we do, because this is coming out, so we need to kind of take a little look. Let's look at this before she starts to press it. Here's what it looks like. Here's what the crust is going to look like. And basically, for our listeners, uh, it's just ground up, all the ground up stuff, the walnuts, the cacao powder, the sea salt, the vanilla bean, and all kinds of, um, what else, cinnamon, medjool dates. And... I also noticed in here that you could use a half cup of pistachios. Is that in addition, for example, or in place of? It's in place of a uh, half half cup of the walnuts. So it just kind of gives it even more of a another dimension to it um, with the pistachios. Um, but uh, didn't have uh, the raw pistachios when I purchased the ingredients. So uh, I just went with all walnuts, but pistachios. You could use any other kind of nut. You could use pecans. Pecans are really great in this recipe too. There's really, there's a lot you can do. A lot of the ingredients are interchangeable. Um, so you can kind of play around with it. Really use what, your, you know, the favorite nuts that you like for desserts. I'll tell you, if you have the opportunity to, anybody here have their own nut trees? Nobody has their own nut trees. I, I, I just had, yeah, your own nut trees, like in growing in your yard, for example. I, I had, uh, my, I was visiting my father recently, and he spent days just cracking walnuts. And it was so funny to watch him. He had his own methodology that he was using. He, this person was bringing him walnuts from their tree, and he would call them up every day and just say, bring me more, bring me more. And he had this, he had a cast iron pan that he turned over so that it was essentially sitting on its top. And then he had a hammer, and I was, I'm talking about a big hammer, not just a little hammer. And he put that walnut on top of the cast iron pan, and he would just tap, tap, tap a couple times, crack his walnut, throw the shells in one place, actually on the floor a lot of the time, and <laughs> so that I had to clean them up. And then the other walnuts went into a bag, which luckily I got to bring back with me. And absolutely, you know what? I don't know what type of walnuts they were, but all I can say is they were the most delicious walnuts I've ever tasted because most of the time when I've eaten walnuts, they seem to have some bitterness to them. I'm not sure why. These had no bitterness whatsoever. Absolutely sweet, delicious. And the other thing which is fascinating to me is that these were from last year's harvest. They had just been sitting you know, and had not been cracked uh, because this year's harvest isn't even in yet. And uh, they were they're absolutely extraordinary. Do not come by asking for any because it's not uh, we're, we're we're keeping them all to ourselves anyway I, I had to give it a, a whole bag away to he sent one for his granddaughter and i had to give it to her i thought about keeping it but i decided as a father that wasn't really very very nice anyway you're listening to great taste on kruu 100.1 fm the solar powered voice of fairfield iowa i'm steve boss this is 60 minutes of delicious radio it's also musical radio tom allen is here and you are going to do what this is just a piece of music. Uh, it's a classical guitar piece by Fernando Sor, uh, which expresses balance. And one of the things that I was really hearing in the, in the story of the Earth Diet and how it evolved is that she was so out of balance. And the Earth Diet brought her back into balance, not only with her own physiology, but with the Earth around her. So this is a piece that, to me, expresses balance. I didn't realize this was such an intellectual show, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> Got to do something with my... Uh, assignment to come up with something interesting every time. Okay, here we go. Beautiful, Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
All right. So coming up on Great Taste next week, we'll be into the month of October. And so Oktoberfest. <sighs> We're going to be enjoying some German chocolate cake some Black Forest cake, maybe some other things, but definitely we're going to be enjoying the cakes. The following week, we're going to have the Indian Hills Culinary Arts students back here doing some uh, wonderful things that uh, I have no idea what it is that they're doing yet. And after that, the third week of October, third Wednesday of October, it's going to be the Society of Fairfield Italian Americans along with Gisela Isidori, who will be back in town, and we'll be doing Italian food. So all those coming up, all those things coming up in the next three weeks of Great Taste will be live at High V, and of course that live show is played the following week on Crew. We've got the food processor going in the background. That's good. It's good. That's this is what it's all about. We don't mind food noises here, and so you are making the caramel. This is the caramel sauce. Yeah, it's um, you start with a cup of medjool dates again, and this time they're soaked for an hour or two. You want it to be them to get nice and soft. Um, and then I put in a third cup of smooth almond butter and again a half of a vanilla bean. You can use vanilla extract too but I there's something more earthy about using the vanilla bean and then I did a one tablespoon of coconut oil and a quarter teaspoon sea salt and you just put that in and um, let it go for a little bit and it actually starts to smell like caramel you know as it gets warm mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so I'm gonna do that right now okay and meantime the crust has been formed for the brownie and it looks actually just like a nice brownie crust so that uh, that's that just you did that just by pressing right pressing down and uh nothing yeah, no just, special just technique with my hands nope just uh wow just with your hands yeah just with my hands <laughs> that's great okay. you know, part of the earth diet is i mean you can use all you know, the blender and the food processor but um you know it's it's kind of primal it's like <laughs> using our hands you know it's good well, I've been hearing a lot lately about the paleo diet. What the heck is that, the paleo diet? Well, the paleo diet, um, you know, they're, they're trying to eat kind of like cavemen. So um, some people think that, you know, you should, uh, I mean, again, that, that's, it's similar to the earth diet. They tend to not favor um, carbohydrates, so they don't eat a lot of grains. Um, I don't even think they eat much fruit either. Um, so it, it is focused around... Um, a lot of protein foods, a lot of a lot of meats, um, so it's a little different. Yeah. Paleo diet wasn't that a dangerous diet because you had to like actually get, go out and kill a saber toothed tiger and things like that. So it had to be for. The, for <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a little different than what we're faced with today. We have a, a new unique set of challenges, not tigers, but you know McDonald's. <laughs> right, right. Lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. Anybody have any questions for Emily about the Earth Diet? Because it's really interesting, I think, that she is going to be a mentor for the Earth Diet. And we're talking about millions of people who are followers of this particular system right now. And I, I, well, the, the thing that really grabs me is I think that what happened was Liana actually reached people on an emotional level. That's really what happened. And even though she says just over 50% are females, I think it's the demographic that really strikes me is that she's talking about a very young female demographic and that to me is fascinating from one standpoint and that is why are there so many people in that demographic that are essentially suffering I don't get it well I think there's people you know suffering in terms of food you know um, of all ages you know um, childhood obesity for example is on the rise and and teenagers um, Liana mentioned you know um, you know, everything from acne, um, digestive problems. A lot of kids go through a lot of stress. I mean, everyone's exposed to a lot of stress. And to me, that's one of the key causes of a lot of problems. So really, people of all ages. But I certainly work with, um, you know, mothers and, um, you know, um, career, you know, career people and, and all, all different kinds of people um, through the Earth Diet. So uh, there is, but I think because of Liana, um, her her age and um, uh, she's created a following of people who are who are a little younger too. Uh, but really, I think what's great about it is there's something there for everyone, and people of all ages can benefit from it. One of the other things is that I, I think that people don't even realize how simple it is to do things at home that are really healthy and and can provide long-lasting benefits for you. For example, how many people make their own yogurt that are 
right here in the audience. There's one person, two, oh, you're kind of, you sort of raised your hand, you know, okay. So sometimes you make your own yogurt. But it's so easy to make your own yogurt. And I actually just heard a couple of chefs, this was very interesting to me because there's so many different methods for making yogurt. And two chefs, one being uh, one of the most famous chefs in the United States, who uh, is uh, the, the chef of uh, the um, in the French Laundry, right, exactly. Thank, thank you very much, Thomas Keller. He recommended, he said he uses a yogo therm. And I looked it up, and it's just basically a, a plastic container that you don't have to heat. And, and you can get it in many di on many different uh, websites called a yogo therm. And he uses that to make yogurt. And there is another chef that I heard just recently the same exact thing. And they love the way it turns out. Another ingredient that a lot of people are, are u utilizing, and I have it almost every day, is kefir, which is yogurt, but it's a little bit different. And that's so simple to make. It's unbelievable. You just go get yourself some kefir granules. You can get them online. You can probably get them from a friend who's making kefir. And you just drop a few of them in uh, a gallon of whole milk and basically cover the top of it and let it sit for a day or so. And you've got your own kefir. And if it's amazing how simple it is to make these whole foods and to actually get the benefits of them yourself without hardly any effort whatsoever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm immersed. I'm immersed in the caramel of the brownies. Well, what I'm concerned about is what's going to happen with this? How much time are we going to need for the spaghetti squash? Because I'm, I'm thinking that it's going to be something that we're going to be able to make really quickly, right? Yeah, I mean, the spaghetti squash um, is already cooked. We just cooked it at 375 for about 45 minutes um, in a little bit of water. And then um, basically we let it cool, and then you just take a fork, and you just kind of um, scrape it, and it's like pasta. It's like a wonderful squash pasta. So um, that doesn't take too long. And then the uh, actual um, ricotta, which is it's dairy-free. It uses um, a cup of um, soaked cashews and uh, about six cups of cauliflower. And um, what else is in there, Steve? Uh, garlic, onion, four tablespoons of nutritional yeast. It kind of gives it a little bit of a cheesy flavor. And half of a lemon's juice. And thyme, sea salt, and a little bit of almond milk. Now, it's vanilla almond milk, which may sound a little funny, but it kind of gives it a little bit of sweetness, like ricotta, like a dairy traditional ricotta would have. Okay, what is nutritional yeast? Because uh, it's used a lot in recipes, especially raw recipes. And, and it always sounds funny to me, and I, I just wonder exactly what, what is it? So it's a, it's a yeast that grows on um, like sugar beets, but it's deactivated. So it's not like a active yeast, so you don't have to really worry about that. Um, but it has um, some good B vitamins. It has protein. Um, I think it has like eight grams of protein for a couple tablespoons. So um, there's a lot of vegetarians who um, will take it for a little bit of B12, although there's a controversy around how much B12 you actually absorb from it. So I do recommend, if you're a vegan, to take a B12 supplement. Um, but it does have a fair amount of nutrition, and it kind of lends a nice cheesy flavor. Yeah, it def definitely adds a very interesting flavor to things. So I want to go over that recipe uh, for the spaghetti squash with cauliflower cashew ricotta. One spaghetti squash baked at 375 for 45 to 50 minutes. You just cut it in half and put it. Did you put it in a water bath at all? I did. I did put it in a, about an inch of water. Okay. Yeah. And then for the ricotta, you have one small head of cauliflower or a half a large head, which would equal six cups of chopped cauliflower, one cup of cashews soaked four to six hours, one to two cloves of garlic, one half cup onion, chopped onion, four tablespoons nutritional yeast, the juice of one half lemon, one teaspoon of thyme, one teaspoon of sea salt, and one half cup of almond milk. Now, tell me, are we going to put all that into a blender? How, how are you going to make that sauce? Yeah, all you do is throw all those ingredients into the Vitamix, and um, it is pretty thick, so you have to use a tamper, um, which is you know this long stick that comes with a, a high-powered blender. Um, you might be able to do it in um, other blenders, too, a high-speed high blender, um, but... Uh, you know, that would be something to try. Maybe the next time I can try doing it in a standard blender and see what happens. You know, <clears throat> I'm using raw cauliflower, but if you were to use um, a standard blender and you used um, cooked cauliflower, that would take out a lot of the work that the blender has to do. So that would, that would work. 
Okay, now one thing I want to make sure that uh, I mentioned is that uh, there also has to be where the drizzle of olive oil and sea salt goes on top of the spaghetti squash before you bake it. So you've got the spaghetti squash cut in half, you put drizzle it with a little olive oil and a little sea salt before you bake it at 375. Yeah, or you can um, just cook the squash and then when it's uh, when you're about to assemble it on the plate before you put the sauce on, you can just drizzle a little bit of um, olive oil and sprinkle a little sea salt so it's right on that. Okay, so we, we began the, the show by talking with Liana Werner Gray, who is the founder of the Earth Diet. And one thing that I think is interesting uh, that I wanted you to share was actually how in the world did you become associated with her? Oh. Well, it's kind of a story, but basically um, I had been following her for years. and um, Not stalking her. No, not stalking her. <laughs> I had been a subscriber of the Earth Diet. <laughs> well, I was talking a little bit, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one morning I, I had, um, I got up unusually early and I went to um, Facebook, got online, and all of a sudden in my news feed I saw a picture of her on a bike in front of the Welcome to Iowa sign. And I said, huh, interesting, you know, what is she doing? Because I knew she lived in New York City in Australia. So I just, um, I got this impulse to write her a message on Facebook. And so I said, hey, you know, um, if you're on this, I, I realized she was on a tour because that's what she said she was on this bike she had a crew with her um, touring with the earth diet book and so I wrote her message not really thinking she was going to get back to me and she got back to me within two minutes and said Emily we're going to be um, you know in Fairfield it was art walk so I went to meet them and I ended up spending the entire weekend with her and her crew and met her and then basically just we've been in touch ever since um, and uh, she came and visited Fairfield and um, another time and we had a conversation about you know being a mentor and that's how it happened fascinating i just love that because it's, it's serendipitous yeah. really really good it's all it's the salesman's motto you know you, if if you don't ask for the order you're never going to get it so it, it's a really good principle you you acted on it because it was something that you, you really wanted to do and and you reached out and that happened whereas i, I think that's all part of the whole process that we're talking about we've been talking about uh, during the show is just having that positivity and that positivity was something that was absolutely key to her act turning her entire life around it wasn't just the food it was the entire attitude that she had and reaching out and going for what it is that, that you want to do is is part of that whole thing and and that's what I love I love that about uh, you and about what you're trying to do and the fact that you really have uh, this mission that, that I really actually um, appreciate to help people who need it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of people in need. Uh, there's a lot of disease that I believe can be prevented. And I think it starts with um, what we put into our bodies, but also it goes beyond that. And that's what I help uh, my own clients with, too, is finding what I call your own health style. So everyone's unique. Um, there's general principles that are really great for everyone, like eating fruits and vegetables. But in refining the diet, it becomes necessary to explore um you know, how do you like to move your body? You know, everyone likes different kinds of exercise. Some people like to go to the gym. Some people like to, um, you know, dance. And, and so that's finding what works for you, what you can do consistently. So um, there's that. And then, you know, going into all other areas of life, too, is really important. I want to thank you very much. It's been a pleasure having you. Emily's been with us for the last six months every week. And now she's going to continue once a month giving us a special insight, you know, or twice a month. Oh, that would be even better. And you've been listening to, that's all the time we have. So you've been listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss, and this has been 60 Minutes of Delicious Radio. Great Taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste.